Ladies and gentlemen, the following segment of the podcast is presented exclusively by Hillsdale College. For over 175 years, four purposes have defined Hillsdale's mission, learning, character, faith, and freedom. Thank you for listening and my sincere appreciation to our brothers and sisters at Hillsdale for their great sponsorship. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. This is the best of Mark Levin. Happy Thanksgiving. Brief announcement. Uh, Fox News Channel and I are extending my show for another four years. Uh, it was up in February. We're extending it another four years. Uh, we've had a great relationship. Suzanne Scott trusted that I could do a show and not get thrown off the air. Uh, on Fox and uh, where others did not and I want to thank her and her team and all the uh, all the folks in between who uh, who have supported this so uh, we will be doing another four years assuming I'm here I think I will be um, four years starting in February and I know this upsets all our enemies out there but that's just too bad so uh, I want to congratulate them. They congratulated me. And so we move forward in what will be a very interesting and critically important four years. And most of all, I want to appreciate all of you folks in the audience. Life, Liberty, and Levin has been, really, without fail, the number one Sunday night primetime show for years. And thanks to you, we have defeated... MSNBC and CNN combined week after week after week after week. And it's often the number one show in the entire weekend on cable news talk. Uh, and we have to duke it out with football and we have to duke it out with Yellowstone and all the rest of it. But you, you show up. And I do the very best I can on that program to make it worth your while. I don't shoot from the hip. It's something we think about a lot. We think about the guests. We keep it limited. We go deep. And uh, now that this campaign is over, we're going to continue with that format. It's a unique, long-form interview format. Again, I want to thank you. I want to thank Fox. I want to thank my family, my beautiful wife, Julie, all of our kids, my wonderful mother-in-law, everybody. All right, I want to talk to you folks for a second. I've been doing this for about 20 years. You and I, we've been through a lot together. We were through the Tea Party and various movements beyond that, various candidacies beyond that. Many of you have purchased many of my books. I've written nine books, millions and millions. What are they about? What are they about? What do I do? What is the purpose of all this? Now, I'm going to tell you something. I've been thinking about this. I've been watching the media. I've been watching the politicians. I've been watching these governors today spout off. I've been watching the, the people who have spent most of their life inside the Washington, D.C. bubble working for one of these entities or another, working for think tanks. And I've been watching this McConnell for 20 years, and I'm going to tell you something. I want to tell something to Mitch McConnell. I want to tell something to Chris Christie and Larry Hogan and Asa Hutchison I want to tell something to the Republican establishment that's still here, still dug in, no matter who we send to Washington, no matter what revolution we have politically. I want to tell you something. You guys are trying to exploit this past election to empower yourselves yet again. You don't care about Donald Trump. 
your vicious, constant, obsessive attacks on Trump, that Trump's time has come, we get to decide that. We the people, you don't get to decide that. We get to decide if Larry Hogan is presidential material. You don't get to decide that. I want to tell you something. If at the end of the day, the Mitch McConnells went out over the course of the next few years, if the Republican establishment wins out, if the Mitt Romneys went out and the Chris Christie's and the Hogan's and the Asa Hutchison's went out and the Peggy Noonan's, then count me out. And I'm going to encourage, I'm going to lead a movement where millions and millions of us refuse to back the Republican Party. They keep threatening us. They keep talking about the people who lost, what kind of reprobates they were, when they wouldn't even support them. Every person I just mentioned to you didn't lift a finger to help these candidates. Not a finger. McConnell played games. He cherry-picked. But McConnell has blocked more in the Senate and promoted more deficit spending and so-called bipartisan legislation. This country is dying from this. We the people are dying from this. We're getting smothered. And I don't need lectures from Paul Gigo and his team over at the Wall Street Journal. Once in a while they ought to go out and meet the people every now and then. And I don't need lectures from the National Review, which used to be a great magazine. Still has a few great writers, but not enough. Who come to the defense of the very people who have created this situation. 50 years as an activist, 20 years on the radio. Many of you understand exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't mean that we support every nut job who's out there. It doesn't mean that we don't have prudence and think about various candidates and so forth. What I'm talking about is if you and you're smart out there, step back. Look at what's going on. Chris Christie gets a standing ovation at the Republican Governors Association meeting. For the last five, six, seven days in a row, Trump, 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 Trump. Trump even from our friends. They see it as their opportunity. People who didn't help us at all. People who do not, when they say unite, do not invite conservatives in. We are not going to beat the Marxists. We are not going to promote the Constitution. We are not going to promote liberty if we agree to this. We have more power than all of them combined. You and me. And the 14 and a half million listeners to this program over the course of a week. We have more power. This is our country. It's not Mitch McConnell's. It's not Chris Christie's. It's not some newspaper editorial pages. It's us. And they put the same propaganda on radio and TV over and over again in the newspaper. Saying the same thing. If only the Tea Party had done this. If only MAGA had done that. If only conservatives had done this. Excuse me. The only reason the Republican Party has any relevance and any power is because of you. Mitch McConnell's walking around. He's crowing up there on Capitol Hill. I have the votes. The bastard has the votes. They all line up behind him. Not a damn one of them, except really about a handful of them, but the ones that lined up behind him. They're not worth a damn. Nothing. Barrasso. Thune. Well, Thune got 70% of it. Gives a damn. What do I care? Gets 100% of the vote out of South Dakota. Why do I mind? Has nothing to do with me. Except 
when he serves as a henchman for McConnell. I know McConnell better than McConnell knows McConnell. Oh, the judges. Excuse me. He gets credit for judges? Bob Dole would have done it. Trent Lott would have done it. Any solid conservative in there would have made sure. Don't give me Mitch McConnell and the judges. The guy's been there 15 damn years. Can you point to something else? They ask us, vote for Romney. We line up behind Romney. Look what Romney's become. A fraud. Get behind McCain. You get behind McCain. Can you run a damn presidential campaign? And now all the losses, the same incompetent Republicans who deliver defeat after defeat after defeat. The same incompetent Republicans, the same Mitch McConnells who opposed Ronald Reagan in 76, who opposed Ronald Reagan in 1980. That's how foresighted this clown is. Runs the Republicans in the Senate. He's their leader. This guy is so unpopular among Republicans, he can't even speak at a Republican event. He can't even campaign for candidates. He can't even go on conservative shows. I'm not talking about frauds. I'm talking about really conservative shows. Can't do it. And won't do it. Because he's despised. Except by all the mouthpieces inside the Beltway. And in New York. That's where his support comes from. The fact that he can't communicate to the American people, he can't talk. He's not uniting anybody. He's not uniting anybody. Now what about Trump? He's making an announcement tonight. I don't know what it is. I don't even want to know in advance what it is. He'll do what he wants. Well, let me tell you a little secret. Donald Trump and I become quite friendly. We don't talk that much. Ron DeSantis and I are very close, very good friends. Let him duke it out. I do not support the vicious personal attacks on DeSantis, whether it's the New York Times or Donald Trump. And I've said it. But the people who are trashing Trump are the people who've never liked Trump. Chris Christie? What the hell did this jerk do in New Jersey? The Democrats still control New Jersey. What did this idiot Larry Hogan do? He opposed his own Republican candidate. He doesn't believe in a big tent. All these guys are grifters. All they do is promote themselves. They want a TV show or they, they, want, a, they want some kind of a legacy. I don't know what it is. They don't have a snowball's chance in hell. And there's George W. Bush. Sitting happy. Where the hell is he? Waco, Texas? Painting. And having a grand old time with the Obamas. Did you know they're good friends? Oh, yes, particularly he and Michelle. Well, the country's burning. Doesn't lift a damn finger to help. Not a finger. The fact is, the most selfish Republican bastards have always been the same selfish Republican bastards. The ones that don't work hard, the ones that expect to have power, the ones who work closely with the corrupt media to trash their conservative opponents. I've seen it too often. I see how they went after Reagan. It took them three damn times to get the nomination. Why? Because the Republican establishment didn't want them. Look what the hell Trump's had to put up with. Don't get me wrong. I get annoyed too. Yes, I do. But that man doesn't deserve what he gets. And he swings back. Maybe he swings back in ways I wouldn't. But that's what he does. So he needs to go to prison for that, right? And they're already trashing DeSantis. They're already trashing him. 
And they'll trash the others too. What I'm saying here, and I want to be abundantly clear, we keep getting threats by the McConnell types and the establishment types. Now it's our turn. You guys take this party over. You kill this conservative movement. And I'm walking away, hopefully, with 14 and a half million listeners. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. Folks, our great nation was founded on the principle of all men are created equal. But far too many of our nation's colleges and universities, including those in the so-called Ivy League, continue to insist on using race as a factor for admissions. And the Supreme Court is deciding a case on this subject right now. But there's a unique American college that doesn't discriminate based on race. It never has, and it never will. And it's my favorite college, Hillsdale College. Hillsdale was founded in 1844 to educate, quote, all persons, irrespective of nationality, color, or sex, unquote. It continues that policy today, admitting students on the strength of their character, ability, and intentions, not their heritage or background. My friend Larry Arn, the president of Hillsdale College, recently published an article explaining Hillsdale's colorblind policies and its related refusal of government funding, even indirectly in the form of federal student aid. Read it for yourself at levinforhillsdale.com. And after you read it, you may even want to support Hillsdale with a year-end gift. So please go read Dr. Arn's article today at levinforhillsdale.com. That's L-E-V-I-N for Hillsdale.com. This is Mark Levin wishing you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. Now back to the best of me. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I hear these uh, Republicans saying the ones that won are in Washington. We should have focused on the future, not the past. Who stopped them? Who stopped them from focusing on the future? What is it that they offered us for the future? They didn't do anything. At least in the House where you have a change of hands. The Senate, we lost a seat. We got nothing. They ran on nothing, absolutely nothing. Well, we can't run on the past. Okay, run on the future. Run on something, for God's sakes. And you know what they won't run on? Conservatism. They won't run on limited government. They won't run on capitalism. They won't run on faith and morality. I've got more on this. Stick with me. They won't run on our principles. Instead, they all want to turn into Gerald Ford and George Bush now. That's the answer? No, that's a disaster. I'll be right back. Folks, our great nation was founded on the principle of all men are created equal. But far too many of our nation's colleges and universities, including those in the so-called Ivy League, continue to insist on using race as a factor for admissions. And the Supreme Court is deciding a case on this subject right now. But there's a unique American college that doesn't discriminate based on race. It never has, and it never will. And it's my favorite college, Hillsdale College. Hillsdale was founded in 1844 to educate, quote, all persons, irrespective of nationality, color, or sex, unquote. It continues that policy today, admitting students on the strength of their character, ability, and intentions, not their heritage or background. My friend Larry Arn, the president of Hillsdale College, recently published an article explaining Hillsdale's colorblind policies and its related refusal of government funding, even indirectly in the form of federal student aid. Read it for yourself at levinforhillsdale.com. And after you read it, you may even want to support Hillsdale with a year-end gift. So please go read Dr. Arn's article today at levinforhillsdale.com. That's L-E-V-I-N for Hillsdale.com. You're listening to the best of the Mark Levin Show. Happy Thanksgiving. Let me tell you something, folks. Because of the lack of strong leadership by this guy McConnell, and not just him, let me talk about the governors. They say, look at the governors. That's where our strength is. Like all the governors are alike. No, they're not all alike. Some of them suck, and some of them are Republicans. We have voting issues in these states. Tell me, who was the governor of Arizona? His name was Ducey. How come he didn't fix it? You think the Democrats would sit there? Do you think they'd lie there like a flounder on the beach and just let them roll over them? No. Well, why didn't he fix it in Arizona? 
And I can go through state after, look at New Jersey. What the hell did Christie leave? A Democrat party more powerful than ever before. Look at this guy, Hogan. These people are not leaders. They're not statesmen. They managed to win election here and there. Of course there's lousy Republican candidates. There always are. But they're not exclusively because of MAGA or exclusively because of conservatives or even exclusively because of rhinos. It's just that everything we're hearing is so much bullcrap right now. Mitch McConnell, what do you think? Well, I think we lost. Speak up, pal. Try and speak in English. Try and use real words and complete sentences. I've never seen anything like it before. And he has a an iron grip on the leadership in the uh, in the Republicans in the Senate because they're all a joke. Certainly, more and more of them. Let's go back, Chris Christie. Chris Christie couldn't fight his way out of New Hampshire. He's the leader. Larry Hogan. Please, are you a joke? Asa Hutchison? Are we serious? Guys, can you speak up, Governor? We can't even hear you. We got harvesting going on in these things. Forget about fraud. We have harvesting. We have curing. You ever hear of harvesting and curing? Now, if you're a Republican governor, you get rid of that crap. The Wall Street Journal editorial page viciously used to attack the Tea Party. As a matter of fact, that editorial page, which is being cited all day for reasons I don't understand, it's basically five uh, office nerds who hang around and write an editorial. Big deal. This is from July 2nd, 2001. I've read it before. It's about immigration. We annually celebrate the 4th of July with a peon to immigration, the force that tamed this vast continent and built this great republic. This is not simply history. Immigration continues to refresh and nourish America. We would be better off with more of it. Indeed, during the immigration debate of 1984, ready for this? We suggested an ultimate goal to guide passing policies, a constitutional amendment. Five words, quote, there shall be open borders, unquote. Did you know that? I guess Joe Biden was listening way back in 2001. And when it comes to the debate over the debt ceiling, where this country's debt is spiraling completely out of control, $31 trillion, wasn't that long ago, folks, when it was $16 trillion, you'll see the Wall Street Journal editorial page line up behind McConnell and the big spenders and lie about the credit of the nation at stake and so forth and so on. McConnell has done this every year. He's done nothing to confront this. Nothing. Zero. Mark my words. You will see. You will see. How does a party that has a leader like this run on anything anyway? What are they going to run on? Well, he doesn't want them to run on anything. And now this will upset some of you. Josh Hawley. Josh Hawley says, here's what we need to do. And he lays out a plan that could come from George McGovern. Am I right, Mr. Producer? All about federal programs, federal money, federal subsidies, but always for the working class, of course, because the government's so efficient it can target it. Government bureaucrats who he doesn't trust should control all of our economic trade overseas. And I go, what the hell is this? This is the new populism, Mark. Populism? You're giving all this power to bureaucrats. What's so populism about it? Populism? You want to know what economic populism is? It's called capitalism. That's populism. We the people. Not some strange, weird... Yes, that's right. 
We have to help the working class and the working people. You're damn right we do. Get the hell off their back. Get out of their way. The private sector employs steel workers. The private sector employs coal workers. The private sector employs electricians and plumbers and roofers and construction workers. The private sector employs, is the middle class. I don't care if you're a Republican or a conservative, what kind of label you, you put on your lapel. What makes you think you can run this economy better than Mr. and Mrs. America? We just don't need a new team managing our economy. We don't need any team managing our economy. Let's look at the candidates that Mitch McConnell wanted to run. And did run in some cases. The state Senate president in New Hampshire. A fairly liberal Republican. Wow. <clears throat> in Alaska, Lisa Murkowski. Utterly un unreliable. Sorry, I still have this COVID. A liberal Republican. He opposed Marco Rubio when I endorsed Marco Rubio during the Tea Party. He opposed Ted Cruz when I endorsed Ted Cruz during the Tea Party. We could go on and on. Who else? What other fantastic candidates did Mitch McConnell want to bring to the United States Senate to help save the country? And he could ensure that they would be elected, don't you know? That's right. I checked it out with the American Enterprise Institute. They feel mighty sure that they would have been elected. Or better yet, if Donald Trump would just drop dead, then we know all these Republicans could get elected. Unbelievable. Tell me, how have these Republicans done? How did they do without Reagan, who they opposed? How did they do without Trump, who they opposed? How did they do without the Tea Party? They wouldn't have been in a majority. And they still hate us. You understand? The Republican establishment hates us. Just like the media and the Democrats. I'm a constitutional conservative. That's what I am. Federalism. Here we have this guy, this senator in North Carolina. This will be purposely spun by the media, and I don't care. What's that senator's name? I can't remember his name. Doesn't matter. No. And so he, the Democrats are going to propose another gimmick to codify same-sex ma marriage. You don't have to, quote-unquote, codify same-sex marriage. The Supreme Court already ruled that the law of the land is that same-sex marriage must be permitted throughout the land. Tom Tillis, Tommy Tillis, what has Tom Tillis done in the Senate? Nothing. But you voted for him. I would have voted for him right there. Yeah, we need your vote. Okay. What has he done? Nothing. They're saying we need a forward message. Well, what's the message? So the Democrats are very good at scheming, and they say, okay, we want to codify same-sex marriage. And he announces, we Republicans need to all get behind that. Just get behind it. So just think about this for a second. Put this subject aside, but think about what he's doing. The Supreme Court already ruled. There's literally no threat to this. We do have issues of federalism, so on the, on the edges, you know, the states have to make certain kinds of decisions, whether a baker has to bake for the, you know, that sort of thing. And he, he blows off federalism. He blows off the Supreme Court. He's ready to vote, baby. Let's go. Let's vote. That's the problem. These are not serious people. They don't believe in the Constitution. They say they do, but they don't. That's the truth. I would ask you this. What is it about a Chris Christie or a Larry Hogan that would appeal to anyone? Nothing. 
Nobody cares about them. Nobody wants them. But the media propped them up. And in Chris Christie's case, you need a crane to prop that guy up. But you understand my point. Why in the world, when the debt is as bad as it is, did 19 Republicans led by Mitch McConnell vote to add $1.9 trillion to the debt on so-called infrastructure that was almost all climate change? Why did they do that? Why did this so-called Republican leader do that? He didn't do anything. Where is the Mitch McConnell bill for securing the border? There isn't one. Why not? Where is it? Oh, there isn't one. Oh, okay. But don't worry. It's the future they want to look into. They're going to lead in the future. I got a lot more to say, but I just want to be very, very clear. We don't follow what the media say. We don't follow what the establishment say. We don't follow any of that. We have to think for ourselves. It's very... It's not complicated. There's a lot of static out there. We discern who the conservatives are, and they're the ones that typically might talk about something like, you know, freedom, individual liberty, private property rights, something like that. We don't need the great compromisers like McConnell because we always lose because Schumer's smarter than McConnell. Schumer is more aggressive than McConnell. Schumer is more strategic than McConnell. McConnell's there burping into his chest. How do you have a Republican leader who can't be a Republican leader? I've never seen anything like this in my life. For 15 years of this. Don't worry, I got the vote wrapped up here. Got the vote wrapped up here. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Folks, our great nation was founded on the principle of all men are created equal. But far too many of our nation's colleges and universities, including those in the so-called Ivy League, continue to insist on using race as a factor for admissions. And the Supreme Court is deciding a case on this subject right now. But there's a unique American college that doesn't discriminate based on race. It never has, and it never will. And it's my favorite college, Hillsdale College. Hillsdale was founded in 1844 to educate, quote, all persons, irrespective of nationality, color, or sex, unquote. It continues that policy today, admitting students on the strength of their character, ability, and intentions, not their heritage or background. My friend Larry Arn, the president of Hillsdale College, recently published an article explaining Hillsdale's colorblind policies and its related refusal of government funding, even indirectly in the form of federal student aid. Read it for yourself at levinforhillsdale.com. And after you read it, you may even want to support Hillsdale with a year-end gift. So please go read Dr. Arn's article today at levinforhillsdale.com. That's L-E-V-I-N for Hillsdale.com. This is Mark Levin wishing you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. Now back to the best of me. Let me ask you something. With all the things the Democrats are doing to the American people, critical race theory, this whole transitioning thing, I can go on and on and on. On and on and on. The idea that the Republicans in the Senate had no agenda is a disgusting disgrace. It, it offends you. I think, and me, because it doesn't tell us what they're going to do. We have another party calling all of us fascists, insurrectionists, anti-democracy. Who's defending us? Who's speaking out? Who's having press conferences? And let me ask you a question. McConnell, George Bush, Hogan, Christie, whomever you want. You know the crowd. How many of them have called out what's going on in this country for what it is? Has the National Review? Has the Wall Street Journal? Has the Washington Examiner? Have they called out these Marxists for what they're doing to the country? There's plenty of scholarship out there. Do they read? Do they know? I mean, they'll pop off an editorial here and there and that's it. Off they go. Back to the same. 
We're in trench warfare here. Trench warfare. Were there some bad candidates? Yeah, there were some dumbasses that ran. Don't get me wrong. But that always happens. I mean, I can remember Romney running for president. Perfect example. I've got more. If you can handle it. I think it's important. We make it abundantly clear that we are independent. That we are constitutional concerns. Can you believe the House conservatives today, even my buddies, they rallied around a guy by the name of Biggs who opposed Convention of States, who blocked it in Arizona. That's the guy they rallied behind. He gets 31 votes. They have nobody else to rally around? That's their guy? Convention of States is really, in my humble opinion, the only thing that can fundamentally save the damn country. But the one guy in the Freedom Caucus who opposes Convention of States, that's the guy they rally around? That's the guy they hope will give them the leverage that they need? Are you kidding me? Jeez. Knuckleheads. We're surrounded by knuckleheads. There was never going to be a red wave. We're lucky we didn't get our asses kicked even worse. The other side is on the attack, on the attack, on the attack. They have a lot of very stupid voters who accept, you know, tomorrow that's, we're not going to have a democracy. Listen to the crap coming out of Obama's mouth. All right. Let me circle back to the beginning. I'm a constitutional conservative. I believe in individual liberty. Populism. What do you think Joe Biden thinks he's practicing? Populism. Josh Hawley says the answer to this is populism. Using government for the benefit of the middle class. Really, and who's going to do that? Which department? Which bureaucracy? Which public union? Do you have any faith in the American people, Josh? He's not alone, don't get me wrong. Then we have this guy, Biggs. He's the great savior now, who opposes Convention of States. Then we have McConnell, who's a complete laughingstock, to be quite frank with you about. And I can go down the whole damn list. Here's the point. You and me, we insist on constitutional conservatism and embracing capitalism, securing this border, and law and order. That's it. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting them from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. This is the best of Mark Levin. Happy Thanksgiving. I want to test something, and I need you to call in and participate in this test. And I'm going to make it very simple. Just for the first segment, and then you'll understand. What is the most important issue or policy that you think a Republican Congress should be focused on? What is the most important issue or policy that you think a Republican Congress should be focused on? That is my question. If you're in Congress, what is the big issue that you want to focus on? Now, Mitch McConnell won the Senate leadership election, and the media are thrilled. Why are the media thrilled? Even many of our media are thrilled. Why are many in our media thrilled? It was 37 to 10 with one voting present. Mitch McConnell never had 10 senators vote against him for leadership position. Now, you would have thought it would be a little closer than that, considering what happened, but no, no. 
Mitch McConnell is the least popular Republican among Republicans. He can't even campaign in Georgia right now. Oh, his boy Stephen Law will throw money into Georgia. All this money they collect from special interests and so forth, and this is why those guys are bought and paid for by the Washington establishment, and they are the Washington establishment. But my question is, why can't Mitch McConnell go into Georgia and campaign for Herschel Walker? The reason is he's so incredibly unpopular. And another reason is the guy cannot speak. He's not passionate. He's not charismatic. He's quite the opposite. And it's funny that people who critiqued Trump last night, some of the same, you know, most of these guys are Bush guys. Have you noticed? Most of the people attacking Trump are Bush guys. McConnell guys. That's who they are. But they said Trump last night was a little sleepy and so forth. It was obvious Trump wanted to change his tone. He was much more, I think, effective in the way he delivered his speech. Much more. He was very substantive. You could tell he was very knowledgeable about all the issues. So, oh boy, he's boring. So on the one hand, they say, you know, he needs to cool it. On the other hand, he cools it. And then they say, whoa, he cools it. And so we have a conga line of people who are going to comment tonight, who commented yesterday, who have the same mindset. And they're telling us what to think. And they're telling you they hate Trump, but they're telling us about Trump. Now, I want to talk to you about the media for a second. I'm giving you time to call in, too, but I want to get into this. The media are desperate for a war between Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump. They're desperate for it. That's why DeSantis has been very, very smart not to take the bait. I'm hoping Donald Trump will continue in the mode he was last night. But that's what they want. Why? So they can knock them both out. And clear a way for a rhino who can't win. That's exactly what's going on. So the media are desperate for a war between DeSantis and Trump. Trump took the bait. Once, has backed off so far. I hope he continues to. DeSantis hasn't taken the bait once. In fact, DeSantis said today, look, I am focused. There's things we still need to do in Florida and so forth. Doesn't mean he's not plotting to run for president. And he has every right to do that. He'd be a great president. And now they're running around asking Republicans, who do you endorse? Who do you endorse? Who do you endorse? I mean, fo folks, we, we have a country to save here right now. The media are trying to drive an agenda. Look at the New York Post every day now with the comical, childlike front page. In fact, it's so comical and childlike that CNN now is touting the New York, time, the New York Post front page. They're using it. They're laughing. They're having a good old time. And if the, uh, the little boys and girls at the New York Post and elsewhere don't understand, they're creating a backlash. Just like the nerds, the office nerds at the Wall Street Journal editorial page. National Review, nobody's even reading it anymore. But you get the point. You keep poking, poking, poking. Oh, look, we're having fun here in our newsroom, in our opinion room. Oh, we're having fun. You're so stupid. You're getting the opposite reaction. You're getting the opposite reaction. And you're going to continue to get the opposite reaction. And you may actually lose some followers. Because this is serious business saving this country. Serious business saving this country. Which goes back to my opening question to you, ladies and gentlemen, which is this. Speaking of saving the country, what do you consider... What do you consider the most important issue that Congress should be taking up right now, immediately, that the Republicans should be fighting for and looking for answers for legislatively? What are the most important issues? Melissa, Lake Royals, Florida, XM Satellite, what's the most important issue, Melissa? Energy independence, Mark. I'd like to see our pipelines open back up because I live in rural Florida, and 
we are farmers and ranchers, and everything that we do relies on diesel and fuel. I'm a teacher. I drive an hour away to school Gee. every day. So that money is draining our pockets, and I don't see any plug-ins on these trees that I live in for mm-hmm. a an electric outlet to plug up an electric car. It just is not possible in rural America. All right, Melissa, thank you. Matthew, I don't know where he's from. Well, let's go to Paul, Macon, Georgia, WMAC. Paul, what is the most important issue as you see it? Illegal immigration. Paul? Illegal immigration? So that should be their first act to do something yes. about that. I Absolutely. can't hear it. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Jeff. I'm moving fast. I don't. Well, wait a minute. Let's go to. Let's go to Jeff. I don't know where you're from, Jeff, but where are you from? I'm going too fast. All right. I'm. I'm outpacing the ability of our phone system to catch up. So far, energy and illegal immigration. We're going to take a break. If you have a comment, call in immediately because I'm not doing this all day. I'm doing this for about five more minutes, and then you'll understand where I'm going with it. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. There's literally no reason to pay Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile over $80 a month for wireless when you can get the same service on the same network at Pure Talk for half the price. Yep, talk, text, and blazing fast data, just 30 bucks a month. Those other guys are making you pay for thousands of retail stores you don't go into, perks you don't use, and massive profits to keep their shareholders happy. You know who Pure Talk wants to keep happy? Their customer, you. That's why they've invested in a U.S.-based customer service team. It's why they give you more data options than unlimited, because they won't charge you for data you don't need. I switched to Pure Talk because I like supporting a company owned by a U.S. veteran. I like supporting a company who supports me and my values, and I invite you to switch to pure talk too they're my guys switch to pure talk in less than 10 minutes go to puretalk.com and our promo code levin podcast that's l-e-v-i-n podcast to save 50 percent off your first month again puretalk.com and in our promo code levin podcast this is mark levin wishing you and your family a happy thanksgiving now back to the best of me What is the number one issue that Republicans should be pushing in Congress right now? The number one issue. So far, we've had energy and immigration. Jake Guthrie, Iowa, XM Satellite. What do you say, brother? Diesel prices, Mark. Diesel uh, prices, exactly. As far as I'm concerned this year, Yep, Joe Biden will be the Grinch who stole Christmas around my home as I'm a full-time truck driver, owner-operator. And you see what's happening, which is a a shock. Thank you, Jake, and I'm sorry about that. Andrew, Green Bay, Wisconsin, the great WTAQ. Hell of a football game over the weekend. Go ahead, Andrew. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, Energy uh, uh, self-sufficiency. And a lot of these other problems, like inflation and everything, will take care of themselves once we have that. All right. Thank you, my friend. Let's go to Clifton, New York, the great WHAM. Paul, what do you say? I say the economy and inflation, one will take care of the other and uh, get get everybody back to work and making this country uh, what it's supposed to be. Okay, my friend. Let's keep going. Frank. Long Island, the great WABC, what's the number one issue Congress, particularly Republicans, should be pushing right now? Taking the lid off the deep state, kind of a cheat issue, but it touches on everything. That, mm-hmm. that includes exposing a rogue Justice Department, all of the internationalists undermining the Constitution and our country, election fraud. That, you take the lid off that, you know, and that is pulling the ticks off before you can address the Lyme disease. All right, my friend. Kevin, San Diego, California, XM Satellite. What is the number one issue the Republicans in Congress should be addressing and, con- and focused on? First issue. Mark, you're a great American. Thank you. 
First issue is McCarthy needs to make a statement and they need to uh, defund the IRS agents. They need mm-hmm. to come out of the gate and say, we're going to do what we said we're going to do. All right. Appreciate that. Jacob Benton, Illinois, on the Mark Levin app. What is the number one issue Republicans should confront right now, Jacob? I think the first thing, most immediate, is to fix the economy, whether that means getting our energy independence back, I think, first of all, and uh, getting more money back in our pockets so we can continue to thrive like we were supposed to. All right, Jacob, thank you. Dave in Boca Raton, Florida, the great WJNO, the number one issue Republicans in Congress should confront immediately. What is it, Dave? Social media. Too many bots have too many influence on the Democrat Party, and they're listening to bots versus listening to people. All right, sir. Thank you. They're all good. Mark, what are you getting at? Stay with me. Monica, Brooksville, Florida, XM Satellite. What is the number one issue? Close the borders. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Short and sweet. There we go. All right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, here we are. What is it that the Republicans are going to focus on? Well, the Republicans have just focused on giving the Democrats 12 votes in the United States Senate to overcome a filibuster to codify same-sex marriage. That's the first things the Republicans did. Under their newly minted leader, who's been there forever, Mitch McConnell, they didn't say, we're not voting on anything until we get the border addressed with illegal immigration, to get this inflation addressed, and the economy addressed, to deal with big tech, to deal with the FBI, that wasn't their first issue. What did they do? They showed bipartisanship. Ah, bipartisanship. So, 12 Republican senators, led by Tillis in North Carolina, and Collins in Maine, because I guess they're the real tail that wags the dog of the Republican Party. They voted to codify same-sex marriage all over the country. Why? Can anybody tell me why? Now, there's some gay people listening saying, well, what's wrong with that? Why? Can gay people not get married? We have a Supreme Court decision that said they can. And it applies to the entire country. Why would any Republican waste their time with this? Why? They say they built some protections in there for religious liberty. I spoke to one of the conservative senators who actually understands how the law works. He said, not good enough. So in terms of protecting religious liberty, that would be a federalism issue for the states. So they want to blow out the states altogether. So this was what the Republicans did. Their first act was to ensure a filibuster-proof vote on quote-unquote codifying, they like to say, same-sex marriage. Now, why would they do that? As opposed to saying, no, we want to fight for these other issues. Why would they do that? Because they're led by a numbskull. And he's going to disappoint you at every turn. Well, what about the judges? That's always their answer. What about his fundraising? Always the same answer. No agenda. As I speak, it's been over a week since the election. This guy was just elected 37 to 10 and one abstention, one voting present. The Republican leader again. Did he run on a legislative agenda? No, there's nothing in the media that says he did. Well, what's his legislative agenda? You're not going to believe it. I'm going to tell you what it is after the break. I don't have enough time to do it right now. But your legislative agenda is not the same as Mitch McConnell's legislative agenda. And this is my point. 
This vote will play well at the New York Times and the Washington Compost. This vote will play well at the Constipated News Network and MSLSD. This vote will play well here and there, you know, Manhattan and, and Palm Springs and so on. This vote has nothing to do with anything substantive. You got people out there who are sweating it to make ends meet. You've got an economy that's on the brink with diesel fuel shortages and other things coming. And this is what the Republicans decide to do with their first damn vote. My God. They point to DeSantis. He's the future. These guys can't hold a candle to, to DeSantis. They don't believe in DeSantis. They don't believe in conservatism at all. I'll be right back. There's literally no reason to pay Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile over $80 a month for wireless when you can get the same service on the same network at Pure Talk for half the price. Yep, talk, text, and blazing fast data, just 30 bucks a month. Those other guys are making you pay for thousands of retail stores you don't go into, perks you don't use, and massive profits to keep their shareholders happy. You know who Pure Talk wants to keep happy? Their customer, you. That's why they've invested in a U.S.-based customer service team. It's why they give you more data options than unlimited, because they won't charge you for data you don't need. I switched to Pure Talk because I like supporting a company owned by a U.S. veteran. I like supporting a company who supports me and my values. And I invite you to switch to Pure Talk, too. They're my guys. Switch to Pure Talk in less than 10 minutes. Go to puretalk.com and our promo code Levin Podcast. That's L E V I N Podcast to save 50% off your first month. Again, puretalk.com and enter promo code Levin Podcast. You're listening to the best of the Mark Levin Show. Happy Thanksgiving. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I rarely am wrong, but I want to apologize to you. I was mistaken. Mitch McConnell held a press conference today, and he did lay out his legislative agenda. I want you to increase the volume on your radio or however you're listening to this program and take a very careful listen. Cut one, go. And so my message to the administration, and you saw some of it this year, let's find some things between the 40 yard lines that we can agree on and do them. And we did some of that this year, infrastructure, chips, school safety, mental health. We need to make some progress for the American people, but it's gonna to have to be in the political center. If the house becomes Republican, there's no more one party running over us like they did through reconciliation. There you go. Wow. The infrastructure bill, 19 idiotic Republicans adding to the inflation in this country. Chips, which they said that'll teach the Chinese a lesson. It had no teeth. School safety. He's talking about gun control. And mental health. I have no idea what they've done to advance the cause of mental health. Certainly not much. That's the great middle. That doesn't address a single thing you folks said to me in the 20 or 30 minutes that I allotted to your calls. Nothing. Is that what Chuck Schumer said his agenda is? Let's meet at the 40-yard line in the center. You know what he's pushing? Amnesty. Citizenship. For all the illegal aliens in the country. That's what he said. Cut four, Mr. Producer, go. But I also believe in it as an overall, as an American who wants to see our country be stronger. Because immigrants make us stronger now more than ever. Now more than ever, we're short of workers. Uh, we have a population that is not reproducing it on its own. No, we're short of people who want to work. We're not short of workers. There's 7 million people sitting on their asses because of your policies, clown, and Biden subsidizing them sitting on their asses. Anyway, go ahead. That it used to, 
The only way we're going to have a great future in America is if we welcome and embrace immigrants, the dreamers and all of them, because our ultimate goal is to help the dreamers but get a path to citizenship for all 11 million or however many undocumented there are here. Listen, I don't know how many are here, 11 million, maybe it's 100 million, whatever. We want to give them all citizenship. Now, keep in mind, he doesn't want to secure the border either. Does that sound like he wants to meet in the center at the 40-yard line? Now, this is a leader. He's a leader, a leader of Marxism, but that is a leader. Does McConnell sound like, I want to meet at the 40-yard line. How about we meet at the border and secure it, you idiot? And he has all those people trumpeting his amazing qualifications. There's no qualifications. He's a he's a suck up. He's a uh, he's a sellout. That's because you're a right wing, Mark. No, not right wing. Cut six, Mr. Producer. Go. If we can get ten Republicans to join us, we will get this done by the end of the year. It's the smart thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. It's the humane thing to do. And I want to assure everyone here, we will not stop fighting till we get a fix for DACA, a pathway to citizenship for dreamers, and a pathway to citizenship for all undocumented. You notice they keep raising the bar. Was DACA now? It's everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and not just amnesty, citizenship, which we knew he always wanted. I've been telling you that for 20 years, sitting right here in this chair. And what is the Republican response? There is none. Because our great leader, Mitch McConnell, is slow on his feet and marble-mouthed. And he doesn't even agree with us. Uh, we, got, we, are, we got the infrastructure. Infrastructure. And uh, I told Bob we'd be we on the 40-yard line. You know, we got to come to the center here. He has no comprehension of what we're up against here, these Marxist forces and movements. He's a moron. Dressed up as a genius. He's a moron. And 37 Republicans voted to extend his leadership, as they call it. And at come January, he will be the longest serving Republican leader in American history. Well, that's sure worth it. It just shows you. They talk about the quality of candidates, right? Well, now it's my turn. Let's talk about the quality of our senators. McConnell's team. It sucks. They're not even average. They've got no testosterone. Even the women. They have no hormones. The men and the women in the Republican Senate are pathetic cowards. They talk about a country club. It really is a country club. They have no connection. Look at you folks called in. You said the border, the economy, inflation, big tech. But there's an arm's long list of things that need to be addressed. I'm not saying we will win, but fight. Look at what Schumer said. We got to get 10 Republicans. And I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up, he says, until we give citizenship to every illegal immigrant. Every illegal immigrant, they let in 5 million more illegal immigrants. They're stuck on that 11 million number for the last 30 years. That's not what McConnell says. Uh, but we're, we're going to see what we, we can be. We were, we're bad, but we, we. And that's it. No leadership. Not on policy. Not on communications. And he stands there like it's a funeral every time with the with the five biggest, dumbest-looking white guys standing around him. Have you noticed that, Mr. Producer? Bassaro, uh, Thune, what's that, Cornyn, the other jerk who just uh, is retiring from Missouri, I can't remember his name. They're all standing there, bobbing their head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, what? And then when you question him, oh, Trump, Trump, uh, Trump. You know, we would have won everything, but we are we won everything, Trump, we were Trump, and Trump. But it's more than Trump. 
I just came across an article that was leaked to Mediate, obviously coming from the Mitch McConnell corner, because Mitch doesn't like being called out for his failures. He doesn't like being called out for his failures. So there's a hit on DeSantis in there, coming from a Republican. And what's the hit on? Well, um, let me see. Let me pull this up for you. I just, I just sent this out. Here it is. It's at media. You know, when there's leaks to these enterprises, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of the classic Mitch McConnell leak. And media, of course, is filled with reprobates and morons. Why did the GOP let Ron DeSantis and Rick Scott cannibalize the Tea Party's 2022 funds to prop up their 2024 ambitions? This is Sarah Rump. You remember her. She's a phony fraud and a reprobate. And she just put this out. With the Republicans' red wave failing to materialize in the midterm elections and no shortage of figure pointing going on as ambitious Republicans seek to absolve themselves of fault and elbow their rivals out of the way, one question that should be asked is why did the Republicans allow Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and Senator Rick Scott to cannibalize the party's resources? Now, where would this come from, Mr. Producer? You think Sarah Rump is smart enough to look into this or something. No, the media are stupid. Now they're left wing, but they're stupid. So they're hand fed this stuff. So guys like Stephen Law, who has his head so far up McConnell's ass that that's his career. His career is walking around with McConnell with his head up his ass. DeSantis's reelection campaign against former Republican governor and independent Charlie Crist was predicted to be a wipeout by virtually all political observers from the beginning. There were a few brief moments of wondering if the Supreme Court Dobbs decision might boost a Democratic turnout or the Venezuela migrants uh, descendants flew to blah, blah, blah. But he was going to win, don't you know? And when President Joe Biden praised the DeSantis administration's response to Hurricane Ian in early October, it was viewed as the final nail in the coffin for Chris Hopes for victory. Doesn't this sound like this was spoon-fed to her, Mr. Producer? 2022 race for Florida governor is officially over, was the blunt assessment by Florida politics publisher Peter Scorch. But nationally, multiple polls of key races proved to be inaccurate by overestimating Republican support. But in the Florida race, they erred by understating votes for DeSantis. So what happened? The financial disparity between the two candidates was even larger than their vote totals. DeSantis collected an astonishing massive chest, a war chest, amplified by small do dollar donations from supporters across the country, and was the top fundraiser nationally of all gubernatorial candidates, according to the Tampa Bay Times. Well, so, here you go. According to the most recent campaign finance reports on the Florida Division of Elections, uh, DeSantis direct campaign took in over 28 million in monetary donations. Uh, his PAC piled up 209 million. Chris fundraising looks laughably anemic in comparison with 18 million for his campaign. And uh, friends for uh, Charlie Chris PAC. And so her question is, with so here you go. Here's the hit. With so many competitive races across the U.S., you might assume that the Republican Governors Association tasked with helping elect and re-elect gov Republican governors would not have spent money, much money, in Florida this year. You might assume that if the RGA did donate to DeSantis, they certainly wouldn't have made it a priority race. Such assumptions, although reasonable, would be wrong. And they give a screenshot of the Republican Governors Association donations to the Friends of DeSantis PAC. 20950000 so less than 10% of what he raised. Just looking at the first six months, she breaks it down. 21 million they burned in the Sunshine State could have saved struggling Trump-endorsed candidates like Doug Mastriano. No, he couldn't have been saved. Carrie Lake. Carrie Lake wouldn't even come on this program. Lake did not launch her first TV ad of the general election. The problem in Arizona wasn't that she didn't, she didn't have money. Of course, um... Masters didn't have money. That was the problem there. Turning to Scott, and then she slams Scott. So she slams DeSantis, and she slams Scott. And who doesn't she slam, Mr. Producer? McConnell. 
for the way they blew so much of their money. So here you have Sarah Rump, a mouthpiece, a mouthpiece for McConnell, a mouthpiece for Rove, a mouthpiece for Law, a mouthpiece for all the losers, all the losers. Now they're attacking DeSantis. This is what I've warned you about. They want a blood fight between Trump and DeSantis, and also McConnell doesn't want DeSantis. Neither does Rove, neither does this guy Stephen Law. Washington does not want DeSantis or Trump. They didn't want Reagan. They do not want a conservative who is serious about slashing the size of government, reining in the spending. They don't want it. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. There's literally no reason to pay Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile over $80 a month for wireless when you can get the same service on the same network at Pure Talk for half the price. Yep, talk, text, and blazing fast data, just 30 bucks a month. Those other guys are making you pay for thousands of retail stores you don't go into, perks you don't use, and massive profits to keep their shareholders happy. You know who Pure Talk wants to keep happy? Their customer, you. That's why they've invested in a U.S.-based customer service team. It's why they give you more data options than unlimited, because they won't charge you for data you don't need. I switched to Pure Talk because I like supporting a company owned by a U.S. veteran. I like supporting a company who supports me and my values. And I invite you to switch to pure talk too they're my guys switch to pure talk in less than 10 minutes go to puretalk.com and our promo code levin podcast that's l-e-v-i-n podcast to save 50 percent off your first month again puretalk.com and in our promo code levin podcast this is mark levin wishing you and your family a happy thanksgiving now back to the best of me in the last 50 minutes, I just showed you why the Republicans are losers. I just showed you why. And why our so-called media are losers, too. Because they're out there regurgitating what Mitch McConnell says. You're going to have to ignore our so-called media. Listen to me and other people who are free thinkers, who are independent thinkers, who are just thinkers. I just showed you in the last 50 minutes why the Republicans are losers. And one of the great obstacles to defending and supporting liberty in this country. Do you not wish that we had a leader in the Senate with the strategic skills, with the ability to connive, with the ability to, to spin words, but a relentless battle attitude that Schumer has for us? It works for them, but on us, we think we need a wet blanket. None of us voted for McConnell. Almost none of us supported McConnell. We have no say in it, none whatsoever. 37 Republican senators, and we're not even allowed to know who they are. We're not even allowed to know who they are. Voted to return this nitwit to his quote unquote leadership post. And meanwhile, he's putting out leaks, attacking DeSantis, Attacking Trump while he's pretending to be above the fray. Then you got slobs like Chris Christie who actually thinks he's relevant. You're a slob. You're not relevant. And then I look at this guy, Larry Hogan. His double chin has a chin. The guy's got a triple chin going on there. He thinks he's presidential material. He's an idiot. They didn't do anything for their states. What did they do? I go to New Jersey every, every Thanksgiving. I actually love New Jersey. It's the government there that I hate. But they have great restaurants, like I grew up with, delis, bagel play, you know, that sort of thing. Well, what did Chris Christie do? Anything lasting or profound? No. Remember when they caught him on the, uh, on the beach, Mr. Beto uh, producer? Like a beached whale with his family? The whole beach is empty. And there's the big sperm whale right there on the beach. I don't know what he's doing, sunning himself. I remember, you all remember that? Oh yeah, man of the people. Which people? 
Larry Hogan. I remember Larry Hogan's father. Now, there was a, a principled man. Certainly didn't rub off on Larry, I can tell you that. Larry Sr. And then, of course, the TV, they have a conga line of Trump haters after his speech last night. Oh, yeah, disgruntled former employees, failed authors. You got, uh, uh, what's this guy, Mick Mulvaney? What do I care what Mick Mulvaney has to say? He's a mental midget. Oh, and then we have, uh, who else? This Esper, the former Secretary of Defense. He was there about three minutes. A real hate on there. Our buddy Mike Pence is all over TV, trashing Trump. Let's move forward, but let's first talk about January 6th again. I'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you a question. Did you know withdrawing your cash from the bank can be very risky? That's right. Banks are now required to spy on us for the government, and they report any behavior they think is suspicious. It's true. And I was shocked when I read this secret war on cash from Swiss America. The new war against cash is really a war against the Constitution against all freedom-loving Americans. So you need to read The War on Cash. Get your free copy by calling 800-630-1492, 800-630-1492, or visit SwissAmerica.com. Now, this War on Cash is growing daily and also includes all forms of digital money. Please get and read The Secret War on Cash free to my listeners by calling now. 800-630-1492, 800-630-1492, or visit SwissAmerica.com. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you a question. Did you know withdrawing your cash from the bank can be very risky? That's right. Banks are now required to spy on us for the government, and they report any behavior they think is suspicious. It's true. And I was shocked when I read this secret war on cash from Swiss America. The new war against cash is really a war against the Constitution, against all freedom-loving Americans. So you need to read The War on Cash. Get your free copy by calling 800-630-1492, 800-630-1492, or visit SwissAmerica.com. Now, this war on cash is growing daily and also includes all forms of digital money. Please get and read The Secret War on Cash free to my listeners by calling now, 800-630-1492, 800-630-1492, or visit SwissAmerica.com. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. This is the best of Mark Levin. Happy Thanksgiving. We are here together for one purpose and only one purpose, Mission America. I want to read something to you, then I want to get on to a few other things. From our schools and entertainment to the media and government, we are witnessing the onslaught of repressive actions, including threats, censorship, character assassination, and the demand for more of it. In fact, banning people, speech, words, broadcast, social media access, redefining language, history, knowledge, and science, all of which are occurring or pursued in our current culture and environment are the trademarks of totalitarianism. So too is the routine and unchallenged abuse of power and undermining of republicanism and constitutionalism by Joe Biden, who legislates via executive orders, thereby bypassing Congress and the Constitution's checks and balances, to institute fundamental change to American society without input from the people's representatives in Congress or the people themselves or the efforts of Democrat Party congressional leaders such as Speaker Pelosi and Schumer to baldly threaten the independence of the judiciary in order to influence the outcome of legal decisions and to further their ideological and political agenda, and the collective actions by the Democratic leadership in both elected branches of the federal government to radically alter the electoral process throughout the country to ensure the Democratic Party rarely, if ever, loses its power to rule. 
And plus, with the smallest majority in the House in decades and a tied Senate 50-50, they seek to stack the Senate with several additional Democrat seats and eliminate the filibuster rule, the purpose of which is to impose radical changes on the nation without broad support from representatives of other parts of the country. Yet it is the opponents of this tyranny who are labeled, often successfully, as the offenders of civil liberties and human rights, obstructors of progress, and foes of the people by the actual offenders, for the latter have already devoured most of the instrumentalities of the state and the culture and dominate the narrative. In his book, Double Talk, The Language of Communism, Harry Hodgkinson's wrote, and I quote, language was to mark marks the direct reality of thought. Ideas do not exist divorced from it. And for Joseph Stalin, the reality of thought manifests itself in language. Words are tools as well as weapons each fashioned by a precise function. The language of communism is not so much a means of explaining to an unbeliever what communism means, this is important, but an armory of weapons and tools intended to produce support or dissolve opposition to communist policies on the part of people either hostile or indifferent to them. The meaning of a communist word is not what you think it says, but what effect it is intended to produce. And writes Hodgkinson, to communists, a majority has no particular sanctity and is called upon to do not what it wishes, but what its duty before the court of history says. Choice between parties is a drab for formality of bourgeois democracy. Democracy is generally used with a qualifying adjective. Like, you know, democratic socialist or whatever. So the wave of repression sweeping our nation is not unlike the earliest days of the French, Russian, and Chinese revolutions, among others. All were promoted as popular movements and people's revolutions intended to establish Rousseauian communalism or Marxist egalitarianism. But that is where the similarity ends. These revolutions were sold as liberation movements where the masses or the proletariat would rise up against the governing tyranny and corrupt society. They became genocidal police states. Of course, unlike these other governments and societies, America is a constitutional representative republic, not a monarchy or other form of dictatorship. There's no widespread dissatisfaction in the country with the government and the form of the government. In fact, most Americans are patriotic and revere the country. But the, false, the forces of false liberation today are led by fanatical ideologues and activists who are the real purveyors of tyranny and even totalitarianism. They use propaganda, sabotage, and subversion in an effort to demoralize, destabilize, and ultimately destroy the existing society and culture. It is they who are repressing the liberties of their fellow citizens through what is loosely called wokeism or the cancel culture. It is they who demand conformity of thought by banning different views from, from social media. It is they who use the false narrative of oppressors and oppressed to stigmatize those who claim as part of white dominated culture and silence the voices of fellow citizens. It is they who are banning words, books, products, movies, and historical symbols. It is they who are destroying the careers of doubters and boycotting the businesses of nonconformists. It is they who are undermining academic freedom and intellectual curiosity through fear and intimidation. It is they who are distorting American history and brainwashing students. And it is they who demand the deplatforming of cable news networks and the muzzling of hosts. And it is they who are using and promoting racism, sexism, ageism, etc. as weapons of disunity and rebellion while claiming to want to end them. Even worse, they're using America's freedom to destroy freedom and the Constitution to destroy the Constitution. That's a giveaway line. And as their poison spreads throughout the culture, the intent is to sow doubt about the country, dispirit the citizenry, and soften the public's innate and reasoned resistance to the point of acquiescence, to the tyranny of the Marxist-inspired and related domestic movements. The last several paragraphs, chapter six of American Marxism. That is exactly what's taking place. Now, interestingly enough, I know one senator has read the book. Others have claimed to, but I know one has, and that's Ron Johnson. 
and he was running against a Marxist, Mandela Barrett. And he came on the sh- Barnes rather, Mandela Barnes. And he came on the show several times. And at least twice he mentioned the book, and he mentioned that he uses it on the campaign trail. You're not going to hear a Chris Christie talk about this. He's going to talk about Trump. You're not going to hear a Larry Hogan talk about this. He's going to talk about Trump. You will hear a Ron DeSantis talk about this because he's smart, because he sees what's going on in the country and what's been attempted in his own state. But the average Republican office holder has no idea what I'm talking about or does but doesn't have the guts to stand up to it. And so just as they seek to literally put Donald Trump in prison, they will seek to destroy Ron DeSantis because these guys are onto them. They're onto them. America's Marxism has made great progress toward instituting its goals over the last several years. It's to be defeated as it must, albeit daunting and complex, its existence must first be acknowledged and labeled for what it is. You've got conservative hosts all over TV who refuse to word, use the phrase. They'll use progressive or liberal or radical. They will not use the right words. What I just read to you, that that's what the Marxist wants. They control the language. Well, don't allow them to. But the urgency of the moment must be realized and the emergence of a unified patriotic front a previously docile, divergent, and or disputatious societal, cultural, and political factions and forces, which have common their belief that America is worth defending, must immediately galvanize around and rally to the cause. We must rise to the challenge, as did our founding fathers, when they confronted the most powerful force on earth, the British Empire, and defeated it. In numerous ways, today's threat is more Byzantine as it now inhabits most of our institutions and menaces from within, making engagement difficult and complicated. Nonetheless, I fervently believe America, as we know it, will will be forever lost if we do not prevail. Now that's on the back cover of my book, not January 6th. Not January 6th. That's on the back cover of my book. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about, been itching to talk to you about, is this fire bomber lawyer. And what happened to the fire bomber lawyer? Remember this person? As explained by Nick Adams and many others at Red State, it's all over. You may recall the story of the two young New York lawyers, Aruj Rahman and Cullenford Mattis, who were involved in a firebomb attack on the NYPD van during the BLM rioting in New York City on May 30, 2020. I wonder if this is in the January 6th report. I seriously doubt it. What was unusual about the case was that rather than be chastised for their actions, they seemed to get favorable coverage from left-wing media because of their elite connections. Quote, the accused enjoy widespread support and sympathy from New York's legal and media elites. Rahman is represented by one of the city's best defense attorneys and former Obama administration official guaranteed her bail in the amount of $250,000. Both have been the subject of favorable profiles in the New York Magazine and NPR, among other venues. Did anybody on January 6th firebomb a police car with a Molotov cocktail? Anybody? Anybody? Yahoo News even ran a false story claiming they faced 45 years for vandalism. Rahman was sentenced this past Friday. The two had both originally pled guilty back in 2020 and faced a possible 10-year sentence with a terrorism enhancement. But then the Biden Justice Department intervened. Garland and the gang. In mid-May, the same career... Department of Justice prosecutors who argued for the 10-year sentence were back in court withdrawing their plea deal and entering a new one that allowed the defendants to cop to the lesser charge of conspiracy. And it tosses out the terrorism enhancement entirely. Under the new charge, then when they only faced a maximum of five years, in the case of Yeruz Rahman, 
The Biden Justice Department was only recommending 18 to 24 month term based on the history and personal characteristics of the defendant. And by the way, they did not know that vehicle was empty when they firebombed it. They did not know it was empty. Even then, the ultimate sentence that she was given on Friday was only 15 months. 15 months, later, lower than the 18 to 24 month term with two years of supervised release. Not only were they involved in the firebomb attack, but a witness also said that Rahman was trying to distribute other devices to people. She gave an interview on the day of the attack saying, the only way they hear us is through violence. It wouldn't ever stop unless we effing take it all down. From the New York Post, I hope they burn everything down, Rahman told Mattis in a message hours before protest form. Need to burn all the police stations down, probably all the courts do. When Rahman joined protesters that night, she wrote to Mattis, throwing bottles and tear gas, lit some fires but were put out, fireworks going on, and the Molotovs rolling. Go burn down one PP. She responded, bring it to their neck. That's a police station. So even announced with a smiley face emoji that her rock had struck a police officer, according to prosecutors, her attorneys claim that she, she should get a lighter sentence because of her commitment to social justice. And she said she had unprocessed trauma from being a Muslim after 9-11. Yeah, a lot of us white, straight, hetero guys did too, by the way. Those are the people for whom the Department of Justice intervened. You understand she could have faced 10 years and, and Biden's Department of Justice intervened and she got 15 months for throwing Molotov cocktails? James Trusty, good man, former prosecutor, Department of Justice Criminal Division, told the Washington Free Beacon that Rahman received extraordinarily unusual treatment by the DOJ. I have a hard time thinking general deterrence is well served by swapping in a soft plea agreement to justify light treatment for someone who bombed a police car, he said. This same Department of Justice would likely take quite a different stance if this had been a defendant throwing Molotov cocktails in Washington on January 6th. Now that is my point that I wish to highlight. There's a Washington jail filled, filled to the brim with paraders and trespassers from 9-11. There are people serving multiple years who went into the Capitol building when the door was open but didn't do any damage and left 30 seconds later. They're in jail for years. We have a judge by the name of Walton, Reggie Walton, who compared Trump to the Nazis and Third Reich and said it was understandable that people would be brainwashed this way in so many words. That same Justice Department, that same justice system, judges, gave somebody who threw a firebomb, let me help Judge Walton, you know, like on Kristallnacht, you understand what Kristallnacht is, Judge? I'm sure you read up on that. Maybe not. Who threw a Molotov cocktail at a police car that that individual didn't even know was empty and confessed to throwing a brick and hitting a police officer and wanting to burn the whole damn place down. And she's doing less time than the majority of the people who are in jail from January 6th. And it's the same Department of Justice. Equality under the law does not exist. You know damn well if, a, if Molotov cocktails were thrown that day on January 6th, or if buildings were burned that day on January 6th, or somebody was actually murdered that day on January 6th, and they were not except for the protester who was killed, in cold blood. Then you never hear the end of it. But as it is, you never hear the end of it. This is a disgusting outrage. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin.
Ladies and gentlemen, the U.S. Constitution authorizes two forms of legitimate money, gold and silver. But our government abandoned gold and silver over 50 years ago. Meanwhile, gold and silver prices have skyrocketed over the last year and the growing political and economic uncertainty. Experts say precious metal prices are headed much higher in the months and years ahead. So to help protect my listeners, Swiss America has a very special offer. Silver walking Liberty half dollars at the amazingly low price of $12.50 each delivered. You heard me right, $12.50 by calling now, 800-630-1492, 800-630-1492. Silver walking Liberty half dollars for just $12.50 each delivered while supplies last. 800-630-1492-800-630-1492-800-630-1492. This is Mark Levin wishing you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. Now back to the best of me. Now contrast that last story with how the Biden administration stepped in to ensure that the the criminal didn't get 10 years but 15 months for throwing Molotov cocktails at police and police vehicles. Now listen to this, Jazz Shaw at Hot Air. Ohio, January 6th, man gets three years after stealing a coat rack. The latest in our ongoing series covering January 6th rioters who've been arrested, convicted, and sentenced deals with Dustin Thompson of Ohio, who faced the music yesterday, like many others. Thompson was not among the front ranks of rioters who broke down windows and doors, damaging Capitol property, nor did he get into any sort of physical altercation with the, with the Capitol Hill police. But this story does have one twist that adds another lawyer, layer to his nefarious activities on that fateful day. He confessed to stealing some things from the Senate parliamentarian's office. Two things, to be precise... And that clearly moves him up closer to the top of the most wanted list. Really nothing. A coat rack. I'll be right back. You're listening to the best of the Mark Levin Show. Happy Thanksgiving. So this, uh, this weekend, Friday, Saturday... Sunday, uh, they had the Republican Jewish Coalition in Las Vegas. I spoke there last year. I was too sick this year to go. I want to thank them for inviting me. That said, Ron DeSantis got by far the greatest applause by the people in the audience, including very wealthy people, average people, young people, old people, standing ovation. They would eventually come up to the stage to shake his hand like he's a rock star. Nobody else got treatment like that. That's not reported in the media. What's reported is that Chris Christie got some marvelous ovation. I have it on firsthand knowledge that about a third of the audience clapped for Chris Christie. Now here's one of the things that Chris Christie said at the Republican Jewish Coalition meeting. Go. We keep losing and losing and losing. And the fact of the matter is the reason we're losing is because Donald Trump has put himself before everybody else. So let's stop. Yeah, there's some smattering of applause, but that's not the point. You go to an event like this, you wanna talk about the country, you know you wanna run for president. And that is your marquee statement. That's your marquee statement. That's the statement of a simpleton. That's not what Ron DeSantis said there. That's not what he said at the Republican Jewish Coalition. And he got more votes from the Jewish community in Florida whether in Miami-Dade, Palm Beach, or the rest of the state, than any Republican in the history of Florida. 
he got an enormous number of Hispanic votes and much better than normal black votes what did he do see this is the difference between a leader and a statesman and a Chris Christie he goes to the Republican Jewish coalition now what's going on in this country that we've talked about here that even the the useless FBI director talked about the other what's going on in the country and you're my brothers and sisters out there regardless of your backgrounds faith preferences whatever it is if you believe in liberty you're with me and I'm with you there is a horrendous skyrocketing on the number of assaults and hate crimes against Jews in this country and worldwide but in this country 65 percent of all racial or ethnic based attacks are on Jews in this country and they make up a very tiny percentage of the overall population of 330 million people very small and this is for a lot of reasons It's open immigration. A lot of people coming from the Middle East who've been indoctrinated to hate Jews. Listen to Talib, second generation Palestinian. Listen to what she says. Listen to Omar, first generation. You've got that going on. You have the Marxists who have always been Jew haters. Always. And of course, you have on the left a lot of self-hating Jews, too, I might add, that set up these organizations, which are intended to undermine Jews and Israel. And a lot of you are looking at me right now, looking at your radio with cross eyes. I can't help it. This is true. But you go to the Republican Jewish coalition, and you don't get into these issues? You get into Donald Trump. That's what Christie does. That's why he can never be president. He can never be a statesman. He doesn't lead. He's not the point of the spear. He watches the media and he tries to tailor his comments so that they are promoted in the media so he can get attention. Because nobody's thinking of Chris Christie. Nobody can even think of one thing he did that's profound or that was impactful, that has lasted while he was governor of New Jersey. Nothing. And the same goes for Larry Hogan. When you have this rise of Jew hatred and anti-Semitism, let me put it to you this way. If you had a rise of attacks on black people and black churches, but they actually had to hire security guards in all their churches. Don't you think if Christie went to a black church, he'd mention it? I don't mean in passing, that that would be the focus of his speech. And then who does he attack? Donald Trump. The reason we keep losing is Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump, to the Israelis, is a hero to non-secular Jews for the most part he's a great man the things he did in America and the things he did in support of Israel you're a Republican you want to be president you're the former governor of New Jersey Do you not know these things You just go there and prattle on like you're on ABC's this week. It's not simply about superficial political commentary, as wrong as you are, Chris Christie. It's about more. And that's why Ron DeSantis gets standing ovations and you don't. Because there's no reason to nominate or elect a Chris Christie. We've been there, we've done that, to no avail. 
We had a Romney. He doesn't like losing. We had a McCain. He doesn't like losing. We had a Jeb Bush. He doesn't like losing. We had a George H.W. Bush who lost the second time around, but he doesn't like losing. Nothing that he said makes any sense. It's all a strategy, and it's a failed strategy, but it's, it's a pile on. Trust me, he would take shots at DeSantis. All these governors, please hear me, they're jealous of DeSantis. They're jealous of DeSantis. That's why Larry Hogan was taking shots when DeSantis sent illegal aliens to Martha's Vineyard. Because Larry Hogan doesn't comprehend why that was important. He thought it was a stunt. Larry Hogan doesn't comprehend a lot. He's not a very bright guy. And then he says, I don't know if DeSantis wants to run. You know, so what? He's going to fill the void? There's a reason why Joe Biden and Gruesome Newsom keep attacking DeSantis. They fear him. They fear him. And other Republican governors do, too. They do. The Democrats want bipartisanship on their terms. The Republican establishment wants unity on their terms. They're not going to get it. Not from me. And not from millions of you. It's not going to happen. I have a story here from USA Today, actually a column by a great columnist, Glenn Harlan Reynolds. Instapundent is his site. Decades ago, the Ivy League colleges thought they had a problem. Too many Jews. These recent immigrants from a culture that prized education and achievement had an unfortunate characteristic. They worked harder, studied longer, and carried, cared more about school. In short, they had all the attributes required for success in the Ivy League. Problem was, the Ivy League didn't want them. Being first-generation students, these applicants didn't have rich alumni parents. Be likely to donate big bucks. Being from an ethnicity not associated with America's governing class, they didn't help the Ivy League with its biggest selling point. That going to college there provides an opportunity to rub shoulders with America's governing class. And they were seen as boring grinds who studied hard and weren't much fun. The result was a change in admissions criteria to reward so-called leadership and well-rounded candidates in thin disguise for those in charge and following closely on actual quotas for Jewish students so that no matter how many applied, their numbers on campus would stay just about the same. And uh, Glenn Reynolds is a professor of law, by the way. Though by then, conveniently enough, the Ivy League was able to find Jewish applicants with plenty of money, polishing governing class connections without too much trouble. But while the quotas for Jews are gone, the Ivy League now, by all accounts, has quotas for Asian students. They're seen as people who study too hard, boring grinds, who aren't much fun, and of course, their parents aren't as rich and connected. And though the numbers of highly qualified Asian applicants have grown dramatically, the number of Asians admitted stays pretty much the same every year. Now the Asian students are suing in a lawsuit against Harvard. They're claiming that Harvard demands higher qualifications from Asian students than from others, and that it uses racial classifications to engage in the same brand of invidious discrimination against Asian Americans it formerly used to limit the number of Jewish students to its student body. These claims are almost certainly correct. Discrimination against Asian students, and not just by Harvard, but throughout higher ed, has been an open secret for years. Asian students, we're told, face a bamboo ceiling as a result. And where today's discrimination is different from the Ivy League's old quotas against Jews is that the old quotas were removed as part of efforts to fight racism. The Ivy League's new quotas, meanwhile, are often defended on the same grounds, or at least as means of attaining diversity. And that's harder to do in a nation that is made up of minorities. In the old days, affirmative action was about overcoming white resistance to opening up institutions to blacks. If a black student with a lower SAT score got a spot in college at the expense of a white student, well, that white student probably benefited to some degree from growing up or having had parents who grew up in a racially segregated society. That's the argument. 
and given many white institutions history of lying and foot dragging when it came to desegregation, affirmative action was said to be a way of ensuring that we got results, not excuses. But it's been more than 60 years since Brown versus Board of Education, and what's more, racial issues in America are no longer black and white. The Vietnamese child of both people or the Indian untouchable immigrant who applies to Harvard, they didn't benefit from racial segregation and probably overcame more obstacles pre-college than an African-American born in New York. Why should these Asian applicants be disadvantaged so universities can ensure that there aren't too many of the wrong kind of people on campus? 30 years ago, he writes, my old law professor, Burke Marshall, wrote an article in the Yale Law Journal on non-discrimination in a nation of minorities. He opined that affirmative action was still about breaking down the white power structures. Maybe that was still true in 1984, but now universities, all of which, including private schools like Harvard, are heavily fed by taxpayer funds. They're engaging in racial discrimination in order to produce what they regard as a pleasing bouquet of race and ethnicity. Is that a good enough reason to deny individuals a fair chance? I don't think so, and I suspect the courts will feel the same way. Well, that's interesting. Because our new judge, who needed a biologist to tell us she was a female with a vagina, I guess, uh, our new judge, when the oral argument was made, she defended using the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment against minorities she was not particularly supporting for special privileges. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Marxist left is invidious. It's heinous. Nobody should be discriminated against. As an individual, why are you representing a group? As an individual, why are you even representing history? I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. This is Mark Levin wishing you and your family a happy Thanksgiving. Now back to the best of me. Christie also compared Trump to the John Birch Society, who uh, Bill Buckley had denounced some time ago. I think Reagan denounced some time ago. What, what does the John Birch Society have to do with Donald Trump? You go in front of a group of people and you just start raging on and on like this? They fly your fat ass out to Las Vegas? By the way, Las Vegas has great buffets. Did you know this, Mr. Producer? Which gets me to thinking, the only thing that Chris Christie has ever led is a rush to a buffet. Do you know this? Golden Corral, isn't that the name of it? And don't ever get in the way. I could see that buffet, man. I could see that that Chris Christie and Bill Barr there, man. Tell you what, better stock up on inventory. Eat those crab legs like uh, like they're going out of style. Haven't we offered before uh, Mr. Christie to come on this program, Mr. Producer? I know we have. In the past, when he was running for president, remember that? Sort of the Harold Stassen of New Hampshire. He couldn't bust out of New Hampshire, but look what he does. Look how he trashed Marco Rubio. Look how he goes around trashing people. I would love to debate this guy. I could rip him to pieces. I could educate him on how to debate. Chris, you're welcome to come on the program. You really are. John Burt Society? You really have lost your mind. The John Audubon Society? Maybe. John Bird Society? No, I don't think so. Think he can get elected, ladies and gentlemen? Not even in New Jersey. We salute our armed forces, our police officers, our firefighters, and our emergency personnel. Good night, America!